This is the Horse Radio Network. This is episode 151 of Horsemanship Radio, brought to you by Omega Fields, the world's best omega-3 supplements for horses. Horsemanship Radio is part of the family of the Horse Radio Network, and today we have an all guys show. I really appreciate these men who care for what's best for their horses. This is Debbie Laux, and you're listening to the Horsemanship Radio. Thanks for joining us. Horsemanship Radio airs on the 1st and the 15th of the month, and I have my producer, Jen, with me today. Hi, Jen. Hello, Debbie. Do you think horses get stressed out by the holidays? Probably if we do, they do. So maybe take note of that for you when you're around your horses this month. I don't think they know much more about the calendar than other animals, but I think they feel us. You know, I, I got to thinking about that. Their horses are very have excellent internal clocks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, they know what time food comes it is. They <laughs> yes, they do. <laughs> they are very in tune with rhythms of nature, and they they change their coats and their pet behavior patterns, and all these things happen because they're in tune with nature. And I got mm-hmm. to thinking, at what point does it not matter to them? Do they go once if? Every single week on Tuesday, the same mm-hmm. thing would happen. Would a horse mm. figure out when Tuesdays are? Mm. I, don't I don't think so. You don't think so? <laughs> I don't think so. I think they live in the moment more than we, you know, give them credit for, really, which is the cool thing about horses, right? They really, you know, they're in the spontaneity moment all the time. But you're absolutely right. They do have a built in clock food you know is is uh it's definitely a rhythm i think there's things there are indicators though you know the the sun going down that's an obvious one but also sounds around the barn the tractor starting up the the fact that you oh, know yeah. guys if they, are if they eat, hear right? the feed room bin open mm-hmm. they it's like ah oh, something's coming yeah, exactly our deer are the same way too we do little indicators to the deer up at the house the deer families um we have a simple little whistle that we use that all everybody on the farm, if they're going to be taking care of the deer, we, you know, we put out a little grain, especially in the winter, just to keep them tied it over, salt block and all that. When we do this little whistle, man, you should see them jump out of the. Well, you've seen them, yes. jump out of the junipers like, and wow, they look who's come coming. from. I know, and look who how close they were. It was pretty amazing. But I think it's a rhythmic thing with them that are indicators that something else is a trigger more than them like a week later. I don't think they know Tuesdays. I don't think they know Christmas. <laughs> that's, see, that's when I, when I win the lottery, Yeah, I'm, I'm going to fund research Good to see we how far into the future mm-hmm. they learn to, how far in the future they can have predictors. Because right. what made me think of this is horses tend to stop eating their forage about for about 90 minutes, 45 to 90 minutes before grain time, whether mm-hmm. they're in a stall or in a pasture, hmm. whether they get hay or not, it's been my experience between 45 and 90 minutes, they will either reduce their consumption of forage or completely stop it in anticipation of getting food. <laughs> now, if human, you, human delivered food. Human yeah. delivered food. And now if you habitually give the horse meals of hay where he doesn't have forage all the time. He gets hay and it's consumed and then there's nothing for a while. Mm -hmm. And you feed your horse the way you're supposed to in that he gets hay right before he gets his grain. You give him his hay and half an hour later you give him his grain. If it's, they'll consume that, but frequently they don't consume all of it if it's a large quantity. They eat a little bit and then they go, no, I want my grain now. So that's telling me they do have the ability to go, there's something coming well into the sure. future. And there's no indicators yet. Mm-hmm. But if I look out in the field, I'll see that the horses are standing at the gate waiting for food. Yeah, There's for no sure. humans around. So now my brain's going, okay, I need some of Bill Gates' money. <laughs> it's important. So that I can fund really some important. research into figuring out a, a proper study to figure out how far into the future okay. that they do that. Because I'm really, really curious. I am too now. 
that's great. I've never, I've never thought that far out before that about has nothing to do with the show, but you know, <laughs> but it's horsemanship and that's what we're here for. Yes. We want to know everything about horsemanship and yes. good people like that should put good money behind it. That's, I, think I think so. so. I think I should write letter, write a well-worded letter to Bill Gates and see what I can come up with. Exactly. He's all about education. That's right. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he probably hasn't thought of this one, but you know, he has a big brain. He can think of it. And we have two big-brained guests today, don't we? We do. We do. And highly educated as well, too, which is really fun. I think people are going to like these, too. I've got Dr. Grant is in my area, and you'll learn something about horses from him that you might not have known. And then also, we've got an Arizona farrier, and he is he's doing his bestest to take care of Horses that need therapeutic ferrari too, which is yeah. pretty clever. Two really so. smart guys who can think outside the box. So we're going to sure get can. right to them after we hear from our title sponsor, Omega Fields. Perfect. Omega Fields provides the world's best flax-based omega-3 supplements for horses. Their Omega Horse Shine Supplement is designed to improve health and performance naturally through advanced formulations developed by industry-leading animal health professionals. Here's what Frankie Evans had to say about her experience with Omega Horse Shine. I have been using Omega Horse Shine for about a year now and have seen remarkable results in both my horses, age 24 and 4. They are turned out together yet have very different needs. Omega Horse Shine is a very natural and healthy supplement that has allowed me to successfully and safely address the unique needs of both my horses. I have seen new hoof growth, increased energy, shining coats, and no colic since beginning the new supplements. The extra benefit is the affordable price. I have been very happy with the results. Thanks so much, Omega Fields. Arizona farrier John Samsil explains how being effective in therapeutic shoeing relies on much more than skills and knowledge. And he says that a key to success with therapeutic shoeing is keeping the clients engaged. Every facet of being a farrier requires the teamwork. Whether you're working with a single client with a backyard horse or a trainer, an owner, a groom, and others with high-level performance horses need to effectively do your work, which is being a part of that team dynamic. Shoeing since 1984, Samsel works with the Chaparral Veterinary Medical Center in Cave Creek, Arizona. Through his experiences here and working on other therapeutic cases, Samsel outlines several factors that will help you succeed. Well, welcome, John Samsel. So glad to have you on the line. We got to talk a little bit last week. How you doing? I'm doing great. How about you? Good. We talked when you were in Wickenburg. Are you still in Wickenburg, Arizona? I'm still in lovely Wickenburg, yeah. <laughs> yeah, you just told us you, it was raining there a little bit. It's going to be lovelier in just about a week or so, I hope. Yeah, that's the thing about here. It, the the rain really brings up the flowers and the desert bloom, and it's really pretty afterwards, so we'll take it. It's a beautiful piece of horse country there, and you are steeped in horsemanship. I am, I'm proud to introduce you as both a team roper and a therapeutic farrier. That's an interesting combination. How did that happen? Well, yeah, I started team roping at a very young age. My dad was a rodeo cowboy, and so it kind of evolved because when I was about 10 years old, the guy that came over to shoe our horses was a really good roper around Arizona. And I just thought he was the coolest guy ever. You know, mm-hmm. he could rope, he worked on the horses, and I just loved anything to do with horses. So uh, once I reached a certain age, I just kind of wanted to be just like him. And mm-hmm. that's how I got into horseshoe. And I'd always had a love for team roping. And so when I did an apprenticeship in my early 20s with a farrier, there was two guys working that, that shod. And I started my apprenticeship and his dad was a veterinarian. So we would shoe horses during the day, and then we would go to his dad's clinic in the evening and work on therapeutic horses. Oh, wow. And so, yeah, so his dad took a real interest in me and showed me a lot of things. And of course, the more he showed me, the more I wanted to know. And so that really just sparked an interest. Maybe describe for us how you define a therapeutic farrier, which is a distinction. Yeah. So for me, the vets call me or I have clients that will call me 
and they have a problem. They have a horse that's lame. Maybe they don't know why it's lame. Or they have a laminitic horse, a horse with navicular disease, tendon issues, anything like that. So anytime a horse is lame or has other pathologies, then that's when they call me in. And so I can either make or put on, apply special shoes with different mechanics built in to either eliminate or reduce tension on a certain tendon or shift the weight off of a certain area of the foot. And so that just allows the, the whatever is wrong to heal properly. Mm-hmm. So in the case of the victor, then we know that's not going to heal. So then we want to take the tension off the deep, di- the deep digital flexor tendon which yeah. relieves the tension off of the navicular bone. So then that's an ongoing thing. Yeah. Yeah. So interesting. You must see so many different cases from so many different disciplines. Is it pretty much cross-discipline from you because for you, your work? It is. I see a lot of different uh, disciplines, anything from large warm bloods to, I mean, ponies, <laughs> burrows, yeah. uh, quarter horses, lots of quarter horses. But uh, yeah, so the vets I work with, they kind of dictate, you know, mm-hmm. obviously what horses I see or what disciplines I see. And they're they're across the board. Mm-hmm. As a horse owner, how do I know when, is it my vet that's going to determine whether I use a therapeutic farrier? How do I know when to tell my farrier he's in over his head? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good question. That's mm-hmm. a very good question. And first, uh, you know, let me say for myself anyway. I always encourage whatever farrier has been working on that horse to come along with me to work on the horse with me so that when I'm done, they can take over that case seamlessly. They, yeah. They've already learned what the problem is, how to take care of it. If they have problems later on, then they can always call me. Mm-hmm. So it works, it works two different ways, actually, in my practice. I will either have a vet call me and say, look, I need to bring you in on this, on this horse. You know, the other farrier doesn't feel comfortable doing it, which is always good when they know their limitations or they, or the owner just wants somebody else to work on the horse. Mm -hmm. Um, The other thing is, is I work on a lot of laminitic horses. So somebody that I've worked on their horse in the past, they may have a friend that has a horse and they suspect laminitis, then they'll call me. And then the first thing I do is actually is call the vet and meet the vet there. Yeah. But so that's how I come across all all my horses. Yeah. So if as a therapeutic farrier, if you were king and you had you could rule the world of horsemanship, (laughs) what would you (laughs) what would you like to see less done of on horses and more done of on horses, you know? Because I know job security, I don't want to take away from you here, <laughs> but but let's say you, your 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 goal was to actually probably just become just a team roper and not a therapeutic fairy anymore. What would you? What are we doing to our horses that you wish we wouldn't? And what do you wish we would? You know, I would love to not ever have to work on another therapeutic case that there was no more therapeutic cases. Unfortunately, that's not ever going to be the case because of injuries. Sure. But for every day, for every day shoeing, you know, it's, it's really a balance. And it's, it's a horse is set up kind of like a machine. They're not a machine, but mechanically they work like one with puller, pulleys and, and levers and cables. And mm-hmm. so I wish that more farriers would spend more time learning about the anatomy and the biomechanics of a horse. And and if they understood that more, instead of just, well, there's a foot, I'm going to make the foot look like I think it should look like, I think we would have a lot less lame horses. But on the other side of that also, there's also the riders that ride too too long without their horses being in shape. Mm. That's the other the other side of it. They pull a horse out, it's been sitting for a couple of weeks, they go on a six hour trail ride, the horse comes back, he's fine. The next day they come out there and he's limping around. Yeah. And so, you know, keeping horses in shape and realizing that all horses are athletes. Trail horses, they really need to be in shape. They need their feet done correctly. Those horses go through a lot. So mm-hmm. I, I have people call me and like, I, I ask them, what do you do on your horse? And they say, oh, it's just a trail horse. Mm-hmm. And it, I have to educate them that that trail horse goes up and down hill over rocks, through streams, rides for long hours at a time. That horse is a real athlete and they need to to be aware of that. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, you're in your tea roping life too. Your alter ego. You're, <laughs> you you are <laughs> keeping these these horses healthy and sound, at least from the the hoof down, anyway. And what what do you see in team roping that you do? Do you ever have barefoot team ropers? Any of those horses barefoot anymore? Yeah, yeah. I had a, a good friend that used to he roped calves and he rodeoed for a living. And his horse, the one of them was uh, barefoot. Wow. And I'm not opposed to a horse going barefoot whatsoever. I, I really, I manage feet. I don't really shoe horses. I manage feet. Mm, that's um, nice. So if a horse like. can go without shoes, yeah. If, if they have enough traction, if they don't need the protection. As an example, here in Arizona, our terrain is so rough and rocky in most parts that if you don't have shoes, you just chip your horse's feet up, they get sore. Yeah. So most of the time we have to have shoes here, but yeah, yeah. there are some that are best. Fit. Yeah. And the other thing I wanted to ask you about too, since you're, you're the perfect blend of competitive and therapeutic, you know, some people will be so therapeutic. They're <laughs> like, I wish people wouldn't even ride their horses, you know, <laughs> and I know you're not, yeah. you're, you're, you know, they're athletes and you know that we keep them around because we have recreational uses for them. We have fun. But, um, what, what do you, what do you recommend we supplement with? What else can we do besides keep them in good shape? What do we, what can we put inside them that helps them too, especially with their feet? Right. That's a great question because, um, I, I was, I found out about a horse supplement called horse shine and horse shine complete made by Omega fields completely by accident. I'm here in Arizona. I have a friend that lives in Texas. She called me. Her horse had had laminitis, had foundered. And so she, I asked her one of the first things was, what is your horse on? And she told me about this horse shine and that that's what she was using. So I didn't know anything about it. So I looked it up. I really liked what was in the product that I've started using it myself. That's how much I believe in it. Yeah. And it helped my horses a ton, not just their feet, but their coat, their, their mane and tails are growing yeah. more. They're just, and, and I think with, with that, it also reduces inflammation. Mm-hmm. And so um, it has the uh, omega threes and the flaxseed in it, and it reduces inflammation. And inflammation is it's kind of a killer for all of us mm-hmm. <laughs> humans. Yeah. And, and yeah, yeah, that's so true. I, that's... I like see, yeah, I would like to see everybody on that for sure. Um, Great, great. Hey, full disclosure, that's that's one of our sponsors. So we're happy. <laughs> we're happy when you say that. We're, we we use it as well. And we think it's a great product too. But yeah, no, that's that's great. And what about, I don't know, is there anything extrinsic? Is there anything that we should be um, coating the hoof with liniments? I don't know, you know, do, any of that any good? Or is that just wasting our money? Well, I, you know, it depends on your, your climate. I mean, here, obviously, we're really dry, really low humidity. So in the summertime, I will have people put a cream, you know, on their horse's foot. Lanolin is great for it. When I first started shoeing, one of the things that I learned was don't put anything on your horse's foot that attracts dirt, that's, that the dirt sticks to. And the reason... Is for that is that it becomes a bonding agent for the dirt to the hoof capsule. So as the dirt dries out, it pulls moisture actually out of the oh. hoof capsule through the bonding agent. Mm-hmm. So things like lanolin, uh, stuff like that, that you can put on and it actually soaks in. That's what I like to put on my horse's feet uh, here in Arizona in the summertime. Of course, when you have really wet areas, then a, a sealant, you might want to put a sealant on once a week, something like that. But most horses feet, the moisture content is dictated systemically um, through their, their blood, obviously. And so that's why it's all, another reason why it's always important to have good fresh water in front of your horse. Make sure they're drinking all the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I would think with those desert climbs. So the, you never, um, I've heard people pack horses' feet uh, in like in a hoof boot with some water in it too, if it's really, really dry and you're going to get some unnatural cracking from the, the weathers. Do you ever do anything ex, 
exterior to the horse or is it, are you saying the best hydration is inside? Well, the best hydration is inside. So what we try to do here in Arizona is just kind of keep up with the sun and and just put a little on there to help out because it is drying it out all the time. And, you know, and I'm not saying that's a bad idea, but I always tell people when they do put a hoof moisturizer on, put it on, you can put it on the dog, you can put it on the hairline, uh, you can put Mm -hmm. it on the hoof capsule itself, uh, and even the bulbs, but uh, don't put it on the sole. Gotcha. You want that sole nice and tough. Yeah. 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 That makes total sense. This is so interesting. I, I don't think I've ever talked to a therapeutic farrier and we do have some pretty famous farriers on here, but they're, uh, they're off doing crazy stuff at the thoroughbred racetracks or whatever, you know? Um, and it's, it, it's uh, like a duel to see who can measure better and, and things like that too. So I'm, I'm really happy to meet <laughs> you and, and talk to you and share you with our listeners too. And, uh, so you're a team roper. Do you have all 10 of your fingers? I do. I have all 10. The first time I ever roped from, for money was my sixth birthday. That was my birthday present. Wow. So I've been doing this a long time. Yeah. That's amazing. You might be breaking some sort of records still having all your finger. I'm kidding. But, you know, some team ropers, <laughs> some team ropers don't, they can't count beyond nine, you know, something yeah. like that. It's very true. It's but very it's a true, great, yeah. great sport. I'm really glad you're you're keeping it up. I know it sounds like west right now but we've seen some some uh team roping going on in europe now these days too it's kind of a growing thing i love it you know it really is yeah um i have a friend uh from hawaii and they rope a lot in hawaii i have a friend in poland Uh, there was a farrier from poland that came over and stayed with me for a month and uh you know he was so interested in roping they do a little bit of it over there he was so interested in that 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 i think that's that was his biggest highlight is when I got him on a uh, rope and he could actually rope something, you know? Awesome. Awesome. Well, you're a great representative of not only the farrier world, but the horse world too. So thank you, John. Thanks for being with us on Horsemanship Radio. We'll be catching up with you soon, I'm sure. Okay. Well, thank you. and I appreciate you having me. Hi, Carol Herter here, president of Cavallo, home of the world's most trusted and popular hoof boots. You know, one of the most interesting parts of what I do is the many horsey stories I get to hear. Most of them are really uplifting. Some are stories of challenges, and a few are downright sad. Recently, a wonderful woman took the time to approach us at a show to share a story about her horse who went down in quicksand. It started out as a really scary story. We were holding our breaths waiting for the outcome, and it turned out wonderful. They winched the horse out relatively unscathed, albeit, you know, a little traumatized, and everyone standing around were super amazed that he still had his cavallo hoof boots on. Scary story with a good ending. Another testament to cavallo. If you don't have a pair for your horse, it's time. Cavallos are easy to put on, easy to take off when you want to take them off, and they stay on. They stay on in all terrain. Cavallo, the world's most trusted hoof boots. Dr. Stephen Grant completed his medical training at the Jefferson Medical College in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, where he was elected to the Alpha Omega Alpha Honor Medical Society. He returned to Southern California to complete a general surgery residency at the University of California in Irvine, followed by a minimally invasive surgery fellowship at the University of Southern California. Dr. Grant serves as the Director of Surgical Education and Chief of the General Vascular Surgery Section at Long Beach Memorial Medical Center. But Dr. Stephen Grant is also a horse owner. Well, welcome, Dr. Steve Grant. I'm so happy to have you on the show. How are you? I'm doing great, Debbie. It's nice to hear from you since our awesome trail ride a couple weeks ago. Wasn't that epic? Wasn't that fun? That is special. What a what a great gem that is out there getting out into the wilderness where there's no people and no mountain bikers and just us horse people and nature. 
So true. We were above, you know how some people climb mountains, they go above the tree line. We were above the people line, I think, up there. <laughs> we, were, sure. we were above all those mountain bikers and the goats and everything, I think. Up there. It was beautiful. And to be able to look back down all the way to, well, there was that Lake Irvine was beautiful and all the way to the ocean. It's, it's a place in Southern California that's pretty special. I don't know what the population is around that, but it's got to be bazillions anyway of people below in the lowlands but we were on horses we were not hiking you know in fact funny side note is I have got to get more exercise but I had my phone on me as we should when we're out on the trail and I looked in my health you know that little I have an iPhone Mm -hmm. and it has a health section and it had 37,000 steps on it for that day (laughs) and I thought not not me (laughs) A few of them were yours, though, because you had to get off your horse because we tired our horses out so much with the, in, you know, with the inclines and the hills and everything that you were nicer than us. You actually oh. got off your horse, gave your horse a little break. Mine just had to keep keep trudging along. Hauling you back up. Yeah, Coco's beautiful. <laughs> I would love to talk about Coco and you. How did you first get into horses? Well, I don't have any big horse background growing up. I know a lot of of uh, horse people grew up with it. And I had none of that. I grew up in Southern California. It's not a huge horse community. It's mostly urban. But when my daughter was eight, uh, we were, we lived near uh, stables in Irvine, which is now gone. And she said, Hey, daddy, let's, let's go see the horses. And so we went and looked at the horses and she said, I want to ride horses. And I thought, what a great thing I can do this something with my daughter, have an activity with my daughter. So we did daddy and daughter horseback riding lessons and I just got totally hooked. She didn't get quite as hooked as me. So she's, she doesn't ride like I ride, but ever since then it's been my journey more than the rest of the families. And what has been the journey? What, if, what discipline did you start with? What kind of breed did you start with and where are you now? It just happened that that stables was all about the English side of things. So we started out with the hunter jumpers and I worked my way up the training with that and eventually had a couple of horses. We had a pony for my daughter and my wife to share. And then I had a nice thoroughbred cross that I was learning how to jump on. And she was learning how to jump too. Probably wasn't the greatest combination of a green rider and a green horse, but <laughs> we had we had great times. I even did some, some you know low level shows, which was interesting. Uh, here I was, this dad, you know, competing with people my daughter's age and you know teenage girls. It was a, a little uncomfortable, but I I did some low level hunter jumper stuff and just just loved it, but. I, I stopped all of that, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, and I just basically wasn't riding anymore. My horses went to other people, and I was just really missing it. So now here I am over the last year, and I'm going about it a whole different way. Now I have, I'm in the Western world now. Yeah. Yes, you are full on. Full on. You have a beautiful, yeah. you're, you're doing it right, Steve. And I think that's what's fun to share with listeners too, is like, you're not looking at it like you, you acquire these things after you think about them. It looks like you put together a great plan for your horse, your trainer, your equipment, your the, the way you spend your week planned out too, so that you make sure that your horse is getting out and getting exercise. And so talk a little bit about how Coco got you there and she's only five right yeah I mean uh, just being a casual writer I think it's very important to surround yourself with the proper people to make sure that you're doing it right you know I think it would be a mistake for somebody like me to try to manage my horse and the training and you know everything that it entails um, myself so I you know I just make sure that I surround myself with with excellence and, and good professionals. So I align myself with a great trainer, Nikki Alry in uh, Anaheim Hills. And so I started over, basically. 
I mm-hmm. thought it would come back pretty quick and I would be just as good as I was back in the day. But no, I pretty much had to start over and we're doing that, you know, we're doing the trail and ranch horse type stuff. She found me a really nice young four-year-old mare that's very well trained, but still pretty green. And uh, so we're on a journey together. And, you know, I think you're right. We are, I feel like we're doing it the right way. Lots of variety, lots of great different kinds of training. I think a little competition is important. Getting out onto the trails is really important. And just, just being really involved in all aspects of the horse. Mm-hmm. You do a great job of keeping her brain stimulated. It, it, how did you find out about the Ranch Conservancy ride? I think it's an interesting little side note, you know, that that you're taking her out on these areas where normally the public can't go. Um, you might we might brag on our area for a little bit on that. How did you find out about the program? That is such a treasure. On one hand, you know, we want to say how great this is. On the other hand. We don't want to get our secret out because it, Good point. it really <laughs> is an amazing treasure. But my wife is a big, big mountain biker. And so she's she knows all of the trails in the area. And she happened to find out about the website for the Irvine Ranch Conservancy. And it offered equestrian access. And one of my big goals is I don't want to just be stuck in the arena with training and training and training. I really enjoy getting out into nature and having that whole different adventure with my horse. And I think it's so important for them mm-hmm. and it's important, you know, bonding for the, for the rider and the horse. So I got, I got hooked up with this website and I just started signing up for for these trail rides and you meet great people, super adventurous people like yourself and our Mm -hmm. docent Susan and just really been awesome. I don't really have a a riding partner, you know, in my, Mm -hmm. that wants to go out and hit the trails and my wife doesn't really ride. So this is a really important way for me to be involved with other people that have the same passion and they you know, it's sort of ready-made group of riders. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is a great thing. I guess you you have to have it in your area, but I hope this encourages maybe people listening to this that private ownership or even some of the government ownership, if they have a docent trained team, then they can go into locked areas uh, on a regular basis, not trampling the ground, but um, the docents keep everybody on trail and keep everything respected. But the public can't really go on these grounds, except I think one, once a year they open it up to the public or something so people can go in and see these areas. But it's kind of a cool way to conserve yet still use for the more natural endeavors like riding horses rather than, you know, taking, well, mountain bikes or motorbikes even worse up into the areas where you really wouldn't want them. Um, there's a lot of – we didn't see too much – too many critters up there. It was pretty warm the day we went out, but you can see critters. We saw a tarantula. That's all. <laughs> yeah, we saw tarantulas and birds, but other than that, yeah. it was just us. It was, yeah, yeah. Pretty quiet, pretty quiet up there. Yeah, so it's a cool thing, and I hope other communities will maybe preserve that if they can uh, by looking into those things. Uh, it's a kind of a trade off between volunteers, and we, we should give kudos to Susan Tobiason here too, that she puts in the time to do that once a month and to endose some people out there. And she has a, she has a heavy duty schedule on hers too, but you do as well. And we should mention that, um, oh, I know what I wanted to ask you first too, is when you got back into riding and the trails, did you feel a little bit more mortal? <laughs> oh, you're so mm-hmm. right. Yeah. As you get older, huh? You just, you know, You don't um, fall as gracefully. (laughs) Well, a lot of people deal with that and they think it's just them. And I want people to know it's not just them, that they, you know, that we're, we, we, we are a little more brittle, but we also, I don't know, maybe it's because we didn't even have a bad experience, but we kind of start thinking about things a little bit more. Plus, you have a job that where you do see some accidents happen. Do you want to describe a little bit about what you get away from when you get out on the trail? (laughs) <laughs> yeah, sure. Yeah, I'm I'm a general surgeon in um, in SoCal here, 
and uh, I do general surgery and and uh, minimally invasive surgery, and I've done lots of trauma surgery over my last 20 years of you know, being in practice. So, yeah, I mean, it's you see being in trauma, you see the bad things that can happen, and and when you're in that world, it seems like they're happening constantly. But you know, when you're when you're out in the real world, it's still a rare kind of thing. But so my my world is inundated with, you know, accidents and horrible things happening. And, and so that's always sort of part of in your mind when you're going about your business. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. it's nice. And I think that's why the horses being with the horses is so important in a business like mine, because it teaches you how to sort of compartmentalize other parts of your life and just, you know, put them away for that time that you're with your horse, not only in concentrating on the task, the training, the show, whatever it is, but also the horses are so intuitive mm -hmm. that if you come with that baggage, you know, in the front of your mind, the horses are going to sense it and it's going to change the way your interactions are and the horses interact with their environment. So it's similar, I find, to doing surgery, believe it or not, because you in surgery, it's the same thing. You have to concentrate on what you're doing and you have to compartmentalize everything else. You can't be thinking about your mortgage that's due or your, you know, whatever it is while you're doing surgery. It's just that. And it's the same thing with the horses. It's almost like a mental toughness or a mental exercise to to keep all of that other stuff that wants to bubble up. You know, you keep it compartmentalized and that way you're you and your horse are communicating in a in a you know strong way. Mm -hmm. And and I saw that with you too. We were focused on getting up that hill. It was really steep. We were focused on how far out we were, we didn't exactly know exactly how long it was going to take to get back. And and yet we're concerned about our horses the, the whole time that we were, everybody was breathing properly and hydrated, that they didn't drink a lot going out. So we were concerned about water and things like that too. Do you call that sort of a form of mindfulness? Is that something that you've gotten into? I mean, I, I understand mindfulness and I guess in sort of an unlabeled way, I guess that's what we're doing, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It seems like it. I, I'm looking at more and more crossovers with the horse world and mindfulness. And I, you know, some people had come to me with mindfulness being more like a meditation. And I, I don't find it that way so much. I, I find it closer to what you described is that compartmentalizing or focusing on m noticing details that you are actually being disciplined to notice, you know, so it is an active thing that you're doing rather than just passive relax. Um, but it does, it does seem to relax at the same time. Does our physiology do that where by actually focusing on things and, and disciplining ourselves, we actually can do better with our physiology? I, I think that's very well known. And, um, we experience it in the horse world, and I think the all of the um, information that's coming out about you know both the mindful meditation as well as what you're describing, yeah, I think it's it's a real thing. Yeah, it definitely oh. affects us. That's great. Would you would you recommend to any of your nurses or any of those people around you they should get a horse? Then <laughs> <laughs> you have a riding you know, partner. So that's right. You know, it's so interesting. Mo you know, most people you interact with have no idea what we do. And I, you know, they see a picture of me on my horse in the office or something. And they, the only thing they know is racing. So they ask me, Oh, do you race? <laughs> so it's really, it's, it's fun to educate people that don't know about horses, um, on what all it is and what, what great variety there is in both breeds and what you get to do with them. And so it's a, just an opportunity. Yeah. Once we get talking about horses, us horse people, forget it. It just will never end. 
It's so true. They think we're so boring when we get into that, but we're like so stimulated by that. I know. And there's so, there is, there's so many different disciplines and breeds and things to talk about. Oh my gosh, it's endless. That's, I guess that's why we have this horse radio network with so many different podcasts on it. It's endless, but, but it's fun. And, and I'm so glad that you're a trooper here. I know you're in the middle of surgeries and things too, to take the time out to share a little bit about your Coco and can't wait to see you out on the trail again. And, you know, any adventures that you want to share with us, we want to have you back. Oh, wonderful. All right. Well, let's go find some more adventures. Exactly. Okay. All right. Dr. Stephen Grant, thanks for being with us on Horsemanship Radio. I appreciate it, Debbie. We'll see you out on the trails. Whisper the language of the herd. Listen, you don't have to say a word. It's time for Jamie Jennings to fetch an email from Monty Roberts' inbox and share a morsel of Monty's wisdom in a little segment we like to call Ask Monty. Leave this world a better place in the magic in the language of the world. Dear Monty, you have a great love and a very special attention for Mustangs, and you've trained a lot of wild Mustangs. Are Mustangs different from domestic horses? Why are they so special? Monty's answer. One should remember that Mustangs are feral and not just wild horses. They are survivors at the highest level. I often say that if I had to guess who could survive in the high desert plains of Nevada in the wintertime, a Mustang or a rocket scientist, my vote is on the Mustang. These horses were wild in Africa before domestication in Spain and Portugal. They were brought across a narrow strip of water to work the cattle in that part of the world. The Spanish explorers brought them to the western United States to work the cattle for the leather they produced. They are intelligent, athletic, and if properly treated, can love their work. For more of these insights into good horsemanship, go to MontyRoberts.com and click on the words Ask Monty at the bottom of the page. Hi, I'm Monty Roberts, and I'm dedicated to training horses without pain. You can learn to do it, too, on my Equus Online University. Western, English, the beginner, or the advanced rider. It doesn't matter. You can connect with other students online, too, on our forum... And there's a new lesson every week. It's a lifetime of learning for you on my Equus Online University at MontyRoberts.com. What in the wide, wide world of sports is going on here? Yeah. Where in the world is Monty Roberts? Monty is looking forward to meeting some new friends, two-legged and four-legged. January and February, he is going to be training thoroughbreds in Australia. Then March 6th through 8th, he has another horse sense and healing way back in California. We also have another one May 1 through 3, and there will be about six in 2020. So call us if you need more information about how that is to be registered. Then on May 14th, we have Monty's 85th birthday. And May 18th through 22, we had advanced exams with Denise Heinlein and Monty back in California. June, here's the biggie for me. June 21, 22, and 23 of 2020 with Monty Roberts, Temple Grandin, Rick Lamb, and other outstanding speakers and trainers. It's going to be amazing. Uh, then June 29 through July 3, we have Monty's special training in Portuguese. Well, the people coming are speak Portuguese. Monty will be speaking English with a translator. And then July 24, 25, and 26, we have one of those horse and healings. August 3 through 7, we have Monty's special training, our annual special event like that. August 17 through 28, that's our two-week course that Jen has on her Christmas list for gentling wild horses. Absolutely. And then... That's it, right? And then September 11 through 13, we have another Horse Sense and Healing. And that's enough for 2020 for now. Wowzers. The calendar's Oof. filling up in a hurry, isn't it? Yeah. There it you is. go. And if you were not able to commit all of that to memory, you can find all of that and more at the website, montyroberts.com. Or you can give the folks at Flag Is Up Farms a call at 805-688-6288 or go to montyroberts.com where you'll also find the phone number so you can call them on the phone. <gasps> <laughs> We still do that. Sure. And for details <laughs> about today's show, go to horsemanshipradio.com where you're going to find links, photos, and more information about today's guests and topics. That's horsemanshipradio.com. And it's episode 151 in case you forgot what you're listening to. That's right. Follow Monty on Facebook. 
Go to Facebook, type in Monty Roberts, hit the follow, hit the like button. And we'd love to hear your feedback. If you've got things that you want us to talk about here on the show, put them on Facebook, or you can call Monty, or you can go to MontyRoberts.com and use the Contact Us button, or you can contact him on Twitter. Follow him on Twitter. Enjoy Twitter. His handle on Twitter and Instagram is Monty underscore Roberts. And don't forget, you don't have to miss any shows, horsemanship, radio, or otherwise. Get the app for your iPhone or your Android. Go to your app store and search Horse Radio Network. That's right. Many thanks to our sponsors who make all this happen. Omega Fields, Cavallo Horse and Rider, and MontyRobertsUniversity.com. Be sure to visit all the other great shows, too, on the Horse Radio Network at www.horseradionetwork.com. Until next time, have many happy horse hours. <laughs>